covenant calls his church to holiness, to truthfulness, to be obedient. And so to have this kind of thing where he says Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit uh, is uh, something that we all need to look at carefully, I suppose, in our life to say, where am I, in fact, uh, so caught up in something in my life that I'm, I'm prepared to lie even to God about that, knowing that he knows everything. And then in Acts chapter 8, uh, we have Philip. Now, Philip, uh, he's going out to preach the word. And that's why preaching is in red there. Uh, that is going to be a giftedness that he has. I uh, went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed, which is the act of preaching, to them the Christ. That was his message. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did... Remember, in the early church, before we have the completed word of God, we have the affirmation that the message that's being preached is true because not only is the message about Jesus who did miraculous things, is it, that's a true message, but the truth of it is being shown to you today by, again, the miraculous being done to support it. In this case, for unclean spirits, uh, crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, the ability to cast out the demonic. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Just the same thing that Peter and John had done at the temple. And so you see these are things that God chose to do through these early preachers uh, for the purpose of making sure that the gospel message was heard. You say, well, I would love to be able to do miracles. I could go knock on doors take out my track and go through the gospel and then heal some people and cast out some demons and boy that would just be great and I agree with you that would be a wonderful thing to be able to do do you understand that that's not how God is working now the spirit of God is always with you when you are prayed up and sharing the gospel the Holy Spirit is going to work in that person's life because it is a ministry of the Spirit to make that person aware of sin, of the need of righteousness, and of the coming judgment. And so as long as that person is willing to hear from God, the Spirit of God is going to work in their heart and is going to draw them. And we have that assurance. So often we're afraid. Aren't we? When we start talking to someone, we're going to start talking to them, and we're going to say something wrong. We're not going to get it just right. We're not going to do it just right. And we forget about the reality of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a lost person to draw them to God, for God to grant them repentance, for them to have the faith to respond, for them to have that call of God to come into the kingdom of God. This is something you can't do, and I can't do for them. Only God will, but as God gives us the witness, He gives us the testimony, He gives us the word, we have the opportunity to share the gospel. And that is a, a promise from God. Now, as you notice, uh, that healing uh, affirmed the truth that was there. But there's another kind of healing that affirms the truth of the gospel now. How many people do you know Maybe in our own lives, where our lives were so damaged, where there was so much sin, where there were so many hurts, where there was so much selfishness and so much focus on self, that when we came to faith in Christ, we were healed, as it were, from all of those things. By the grace of God, we were received by Him. We were accepted by Him. And we were made a part of his family. And isn't that the greatest miracle of all? That God would take a sinner like me. And he would save me and change me. And promise to make me like his son Jesus. Because I can have physical healing over and over and over in my physical lifetime. And still die and be in hell forever. But to be saved. It's the most important miracle of all. And if people can see you and see me as born again children of God, 
overtly living out our Christian faith, then we are demonstrating that miracle to them again and again. Well, let's look at Philip again a little further. Acts uh, 8.12 and Acts 21.8. Uh, here again, Philip, he's preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And they were baptized, both men and women. What's the message? Well, he was called to preach something very specific. It wasn't just to preach nice things. It wasn't health, wealth, and prosperity. It wasn't you know, your best life now. It was the message of the good news about the kingdom of God has come. And in the name of Jesus Christ, you can be saved. You can become a part of the kingdom of God. And then having been born again, you can be baptized into the church and begin to minister to each other and to a lost world. Both men and women is a significant statement there because in the Old Testament there really wasn't a lot of discussion about salvation in women. There has been no one in the history of the world that has done more for women than Jesus Christ. Amen. And as for all the people who do not believe it, they will know it in eternity. Amen. Acts chapter 21 verse 8. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. We entered the house of Philip, the evangelist. Now their understanding is expanding that, you know, Philip is not just a, an excellent preacher, but God has gifted him specifically to share the gospel in a powerful way with people who are lost. And so they see that gift of evangelism. Uh, and so now... That, that understanding begins to grow as, as things, are being, things are being revealed and recorded in Scripture and we see the giftedness that is there. Another example in Acts chapter 18 in verse 24 is a Jew named Apollos. Have we ever heard of this guy? I think we have. Back at the beginning of 1 Corinthians. Some say that they're of Paul and some are of Apollos and some are of Christ. Do you remember that? Well, here he is, a native of Alexandria. He came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man. What did the Corinthians like? They liked eloquence. So they were fired up about it. Well, here's the other thing. He was competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ, the Messiah, was Jesus. So he had, he had put his faith and trust in Jesus, and yet he had not seen everything that there was to the response of the gospel. Uh, I think that the uh, indication here by all commentators is that he was already born again. That's why he had the power of God to do that. He simply didn't have uh, every bit of the information that he needed to know to complete the message that he was preaching. But notice what it says there. Competent in the scriptures, spoke and taught. For us to speak, for us to teach. We don't have to have a Sunday school class or a pulpit. For us to speak and for us to teach, we simply have to have another person who is willing to hear and to learn. And we have those kinds of people all around us. See, in your concentric circles of concern, if you put your life, your home, your, your circumstance, and your mind in the middle of the uh, a dot here and you think about the circle around you my family the one outside of that my neighborhood outside of that my community outside of that my state outside of that my nation and just like you took a rock and you threw it into water and it created rings that go out from that point that point of your life and all of the circles that surround it, the grocery store people you talk to, the people you see at the bank, uh, the, the folks that are at work, those are the people to whom God gives us the opportunity to speak and to teach. Say, well, there are problems with that. Now, 
you know, I can't just do that sort of thing where I work anymore. And you know, understand that when you're at work, you're supposed to do your work. Your employer deserves to have the work that comes from you being there to work. But when God gives you the opportunity, and there are times when you're eating, there are times when you're traveling, there are times when you have divine appointments that God sets before you and sets before me. And these are the times that He gives us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Regardless of the giftedness that we have, see, as you share the gospel, you may be uh, the person with the gift of encouragement, and you may encourage their socks off while you're trying to get them to come to faith in Christ. And another person with a, a different spiritual giftedness may have a different way they are using that, that spiritual gift is happening, but they're still presenting the gospel to speak it and to teach it. What are we teaching? Uh, we don't want to just teach our personal opinions. We don't want to just share what the culture shares. We don't want them to just hear what the world will tell them. Everybody's going to make it if they just hang in there. We don't really need to ruffle any feathers. We don't need to do anything. Just let people go and you encourage them and support them and, and they're going to figure it out. Now, to be confident in the scriptures means that we know that all are sinners. We have sinned against God. We've rebelled against Him. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. But to have that eternal life means that we have to come to Jesus for it. Even as the song talked about the way, Jesus is the Savior for all of you. But not all of the world is going to receive Him. Today, if you've not personally received Him, you need to do that so that you can begin to experience not only what is in the Bible, but what the Bible is pointing us to, which is a faithful relationship with Christ. Where he is at work in our life day by day to make him like himself as we are turning to the scriptures. Notice in verse 28, it says, For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ, the Messiah, was Jesus. You see, he was dealing with, more than likely, very religious people here. They were Jews and very religious. But they were refusing to accept that Jesus was, in fact, their promised Messiah. And so, here was another thing that had to happen. Even within the spiritual giftedness that Apollos had, he had to understand the Word of God enough to be able to show them, look, here's what the Bible promised about Messiah. Here's how Jesus fulfilled it. Here's what the Bible promised about Messiah, and here's how he fulfilled it. And to be able to show them, step by step, all the things that they had in prophecy in the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfilled them. And we have that to do today. Uh, one of the ways we encourage people is to be a part of the Bible Prophecy Conference. That's coming up this month, the 27th through the 29th. And you'll hear people talk about biblical prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. If you know what they are, and you can show people things that God has already done in the past and tell them about the things that God is going to do and eventually accomplish. And even if they don't believe the things that you've shown them from the past, when the other things begin to come to pass, guess what the Spirit of God is going to do with it? He's going to bring it to their memory. He's going to bring to their remembrance the Scripture passages that you shared. He's going to draw those people to Christ. So all of these things are important for us to remember. And then in Acts 13, 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Again, those were the spiritual giftedness. Remember the kinds of gifts that we talked about. There were the speaking gifts and there were the serving gifts. And a lot of the serving gifts were behind the scenes. So the ones that are the speaking gifts, like prophets and teachers, are obviously more seen. And in this case, Barnabas and Simeon, uh, and they're working in this situation, preaching and teaching. But once people are being saved, what's beginning to happen as that church is built? 
God is placing by His Spirit into the life of those new believers every giftedness that will be needed to cause that church that is just coming into existence in Antioch to have all of the gifts that are needed to faithfully walk with the Lord. He's doing that here. He brought you here. He saved you. He's gifted you for the purpose of serving Him in the church by serving each other. And to reach the world. That is what He is doing here at Little Cypress Baptist Church. In Acts 13, 4. So seeing, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to uh, Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God. Proclaiming the word again, a verbal gift that creates a situation where people can respond and be saved. And then the giftedness begins to grow. And then look what John is doing. Does it say anything about him proclaiming the word? What does it say he's doing? He's assisting. See, maybe this is a gift of helps. Maybe it's some gift of administration where he helps organize things. Whatever it might be, he is differentiated in this passage as serving in a different kind of giftedness. In James 3... This is a passage that many people have used to disobey God. <laughs> and I say that and, and I, I laugh. But the reality is, is that there have been a number of people in the church who God may have gifted to be a teacher. And He's gifted them to do that. And they look at their flesh and they look in the mirror and they say, You can't be a teacher, I know you. You're sorry. You've done all kinds of bad things. Nobody's ever going to accept you.